Welcome to our second episode now in our series, Temptations Common to Men and Women. This week, we're gonna take our discussion a little bit further for com t common temptations to men. And we're gonna include topics like aggression uh, or laziness. And again, this doesn't necessarily apply to every man or it's not necessarily unique to men versus women. Again, nonetheless, uh, consistent patterns that I found in pastoral counseling. I want you to understand that each of you might not struggle with this, but it's important that each of us in, in the body of believers is sensitive to and empathetic to what other brothers in Christ might be going through and how we can train ourselves to be helpful and supportive to those who do have these struggles. I want to talk about the issue of, we talked a little bit about like ego and competitiveness. Uh, if it takes even a step further, it can turn into things like bullying, aggression, violence, uh, that type of thing. And again, guys are wired a little bit differently in this regard. Guys are, are the Jerry Seinfeld had a joke where he said, guys are the, the type that when we engage in a lifestyle where we're cracking our heads, uh, we don't think I should stop this head cracking lifestyle. We think, okay, I'll put a helmet on and continue on in my head cracking lifestyle. And that's like, there's a level of impact that guys and physicality that guys seem to be somehow like wire, wired for. This is true. Interestingly, it's a true in the male of any species. So in wolf packs, there is such a thing as like a, a pack leader or an alpha male. Uh, this is true. And in, in, uh, chickens talk about like a pecking order, but my, one of my favorite ones, uh, anybody that's listened to me for a while knows I'm a, a Jordan Peterson fan. And he talks about lobsters and lobsters do like a little dance where they dance around each other like boxers. They put up their claws like real big and they actually have little uh, liquid sprays that they shoot out underneath their eyes uh, at another guy, not to like uh, fight against them, but to let them know what they are. It tells them how big they are. It tells them that what their mood is. It tells them all that kind of stuff. And they're trying to intimidate. Like they're literally trying to bully one another. And it's a dominance hierarchy thing. Guys, human guys, I think do the exact same thing in so many different ways. Uh, men are five times more likely, uh, more than five times more likely to commit violent crimes. They're 10 times more likely to be incarcerated. They're five times more likely to steal. Uh, they constitute 99% of all, 99% uh, plus of all rape cases, 80% uh, plus of arson, burglary, auto theft, et cetera. Why is that, do you think? Is it just a matter of like testosterone breeds aggressive behavior? Uh, or do you think there's other things possibly attached to that level of like bullying or aggression or violence? I think I've found that the easiest way for me to answer that is as a dad, again, going back to that, I, I've noticed that my kids really do emulate what I do. And when I talk to them very aggressively, and if I yell a lot, then I'll start hearing as I'm doing other things in the house, I'll start hearing a lot of aggressive and violent talk mm. between my children. Um, so it seems to me from where I'm sitting that a lot of that comes from the home. And if, if kids are growing up in, in violent houses where there's aggression and there isn't accountability, and especially where the word of God isn't being fortified every single day yeah. and prayer isn't a daily habit, that that's going to be, you know, the inevitable consequence of, of growing up in that sort of lifestyle. Yeah. And it's actually, so it's not that all, this is another thing, even though we, we talked about work not being bad, work is a good thing. Workaholism would be unhealthy. Physicality in and of itself, like living a physical lifestyle, working with your hands, uh, even like the concept of being strong to defend people like uh, militarily or, or whatever else. There's nothing wrong about that. That's a positive and, and blessed trait. But it's when you start thinking about like, uh, how can I use this for my own benefit uh, versus the benefit of others? And so do you think, can I ask you this amongst your boys and girls, do you think, do they show different levels of aggression or do they show, is it pretty much the same across the board? Yeah, I think not surprisingly, I think my boys are probably slightly more aggressive, but I think that says a lot considering they are the they're the furthest apart in age, at least with the exception of our two week old. Um, our two girls are about 14 months apart, so I think they butt heads a lot, but yeah. it's not always the same aggressive 
behavior that I can see coming from my boys. So it it might be kind of a natural thing. It also might be a little bit of a socially conditioned thing. I grew up, so I grew up with uh, G.I. Joe, Transformers. Um, I forget what else, but they all they all had guns, lasers, <laughs> uh, everything. And it was just like, okay, so this is my child brain is like, okay, use whatever weaponry you can find to take <laughs> down people that you perceive as the bad guys. And it's like, okay, that's children's, uh, like children's entertainment. And, uh, I remember hearing some moms criticizing it at the time and thinking like, this is no big deal. But as I look back on it, thinking like, okay, that's a little aggressive, you know, kind of thing. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Do you think, I actually mentioned this in a sermon recently. Do you think bullying, the topic of bullying, uh, is it's, it's much more talked about today than I remember hearing it as a child. Uh, do you think it's, was it not talked about enough back then, like when we were growing up, or is it, uh, is there almost even an overemphasis on it today? Well, today there's such a need for it based off of cyberbullying. I yeah. don't know so much physical bullying. Yeah. That might not be as prevalent as it used to be. I'm not sure, but cyberbullying's huge <laughs> and it's all over the place. Yeah. So inter- I'm glad you brought that up because even that is one thing I might have thought with, between social media and whatnot that women were more inclined to participate in what is constituted as, as cyberbullying and it's still men 2 to 1 uh, over women. There seems to be something about like that dominance hierarchy thing of like I'm going to put somebody else in their place uh that is uniquely kind of a male thing. Going back to the beginning, I wonder if it's the comparison thing. Yeah. You know, we're always trying to compare and trump someone else. And if uh, it's it's the King Saul, if if I have to relate myself to anybody in the Bible, it's King Saul, which I hate yeah. to say, but he's <laughs> he's the most relatable to me because I just there's sometimes I catch myself just constantly being in cycles of comparing myself in my head, like fantasizing that like, oh, this person would respond this way. How yeah. dare they? My yeah. thoughts are superior. Yeah. And um. Yeah, and it uh, slowly kind of, I feel like I have to somehow build myself up and put myself back on that hierarchy. It's it's the yeah. alpha male complex. Yeah, and you're right. He is kind of like, if you characterize each Bible character by one like unique trait that stands out, Saul is just this pride issue. And appearances for that matter. He starts out very weak uh, and insecure, but actually people who are very proud have like a deep underlying insecurity, generally speaking. Um. Slightly different issue I want to talk about, but it's, again, one that so far as I can tell in researching men struggle with more than women uh, is the issue. Maybe this is a socially acceptable thing, again, uh, but drinking. Um, 20%, so one of over tw- one out of every five men report binge drinking uh, on a monthly basis, and the average is five times a month. By binge drinking, what they're saying is eight or more drinks in a matter of uh, like one sitting kind of thing. Uh, so like clearly enough to get you legally drunk, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, men are twice as likely or more to have an alcohol use disorder than women. Uh, there's about 70,000 excessive drinking deaths in the U.S. each year, and over 80% of those are men. So of those who are men are more likely to drink too much, but they're also more likely to die by drinking uh, even within those percentages. Uh, They're three times more likely, and this goes back to the violence thing, I think, they're three times more likely to commit suicide, and there's a really, really high correlation rate with drinking amongst those suicides. Uh, To what extent do you think uh, for men in your own life uh, that excessive alcohol consumption is an issue, and what do you think is like the underlying cause of that? Is it because it's just... You know, like we live in Wisconsin. It's like, okay, there's beer at everything. Uh, and, um, you know, we have Christian freedom uh, in terms of like drinking, but we don't have Christian freedom in terms of like drunkenness. So like, where do you think, uh, why is this a uniquely male thing? And what to what extent has this been a part of your life growing up? I think it goes back to competition. I mean, you know, from one guy to another, if you can put out or you know put away a 12 pack of beer and he can't you know that's that's something you can hang in your hat and it's an award (laughs) it's unfortunate (laughs) but um yeah and and you know you brought it up but yeah we have that that christian freedom and yet you know paul or uh, peter was told 
you know, kill and eat, you know, you, you have the freedom to eat what you want, but certainly he wasn't, you know, being told, go ahead and, you know, eat 600 pieces of bacon yep. from that pig and, yeah. you know, go nuts, which, you know, when you talk about alcohol, you know, dr drinking too much, obviously that's, that's where we, you know, run into a whole lot of issues and suicide and things like that. But, um, yeah, I, I feel that, you know, we, we do set ourselves up for failure with it when we, uh, you know, treat it so acceptable and other churches, you know, other denominations will say no alcohol whatsoever. Right. Yeah. Um, and we could probably talk about that for hours, you know, just the, the ramifications of that. But, yeah. um, I certainly enjoy alcohol and, and I, I know that there is a line that, you know, when you cross it, it's too much. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it just comes back to competition, you know, yeah. one man to another. I know people who are down on their luck more might do it for this reason. Uh, men and women bio biologically have just been designed in slightly different ways where women more often just are naturally designed to focus on multiple things at once. So sure. it's like they have multiple computer screens up open at once where men you only can focus on that one thing which is why yeah. men so often aren't really paying attention to what their wives are saying when they're like <laughs> watching tv or right. doing whatever and it might be that also where uh, a man who's just down on his luck has something that they're fixated on just wants a release from it and a break from it and alcohol is the way to do that i think that's an excellent point escapism like i just don't want to feel anything about this anymore because i hate i hate feeling stuff i hate my feelings i don't know how to process my feelings in healthy ways and i just want to be numb and uh so what alcohol does is it helps you let go of like inhibitions uh, it doesn't help you. It, interestingly enough, uh, alcohol research says guys who drink excessively know what might come. They're not unaware of it. They just don't care. Like it helps them not care about stuff. And like to become numb to something that you're afraid of or caring too much about or whatever, it becomes just that tremendous coping technique. And maybe it's the combination then of like social acceptability. Uh, this is just what we do as a culture. This is what my family does. This is what my friend group does. Uh, when people go out, this is the primary thing they're going to do probably is grab a drink, but then it becomes an easy technique for, um, self-medicating concerns, fears, anxieties, etc. Yeah. When, when it comes to drinking, that definitely feeds, uh, the male ego, you know, it's, yeah. it'll, it'll make you right. feel Bravado. like it'll make you think that you're better than what you actually are. Yes. And, um, I've actually, there are some some proverbs that you know like i always have in my mind now when i when i think about drinking you know it's uh you'd have to google it to know exactly where it's at but it's like um it says uh let them drink and forget their poverty yeah. so you know to me that's like okay you know you see a lot of you know poor people or you know people that's in ruin their lives they just drink and it's, you know, yeah. it's like, okay, it makes you forget your poverty to me now because that's what scriptures say. So, yep. you know, I know when I drink now, that's where I'm at, you yeah. know? So like, no matter how it feels to me, I know I've been drinking. I know this what it says. And yep. it also says, um, there's another scripture that says, uh, don't drink and think of yourself more highly than you um, ought to. Yep. So, you know, it's like information like that, that's from the Bible and that's true. Yeah. When I'm drinking, I have that in mind, like, okay, no matter how I'm feeling, yeah. you know, when I'm like, this is what is going on, yeah. you know. There's a, so uh, in Ephesians, there's a passage that says, don't get drunk on wine or alcohol, get drunk, get filled up with the Holy Spirit. And Paul seems to be giving some kind of interesting indicator that like, the reasons that you probably do get filled up on alcohol is because to some extent you don't have enough spirit. So like maybe you are anxious about stuff. If you had more spirit, you wouldn't be so anxious. If you were secure in who you are as a redeemed child of God, you wouldn't be so afraid to talk to people. Uh, if you realize that God was in control of all things, you wouldn't feel like uh, my, my life is spinning out of control and I'm nervous about whatever. So like if you were filled on the spirit, you wouldn't feel the need to binge drink uh, and numb all those kind of pain, uh, painful like feelings. Um, good. Anything else on uh, the drinking piece? Um, I want to move finally then on to, uh, this idea of, I, I want to take us back to the 
Genesis three concept, because I think there's so much embedded in there about gender, uh, man and woman created differently, uh, man and woman. Uh, I think honestly, the, this first sin at the tree of knowledge of good and evil is in some ways a tragedy of gender roles, uh, because, and I'll talk with the ladies when we have that conversation about this too, but you have, uh, Eve who knows three people, God, Adam, and herself. And the other two are both heads of somebody, and she's at this point not the head of uh, not the head of anybody. And I think she feels insecure about it, and is seeing, okay, wait a second, if I eat from this fruit, it will give me a special knowledge that will put me somehow on the level of uh, my husband and God in a different kind of way. Uh, and maybe that's part of the temptation. But for Adam, it's the crazy thing is she eats from the tree. Uh, and she immediately gives it to Adam and he eats from it too, which means he had to be there. And even though he was supposed to be spiritually leading uh, and God said, yeah, okay, don't eat from this tree. And he only tells it to Adam and Adam's supposed to communicate to this wife. Uh, Adam does not intervene. And so he's not leading the way he's supposed to. And it's really interesting when I talk to uh, men and women when I do premarital counseling. And when we get into this concept of like spiritual headship in the home and in the church, and I would say the majority of the time when women are scared about that idea of headship, what they're afraid of is like an abuse of the headship. So like if he has that level of authority or power in any kind of relationship dynamic, he, what if he uses that to take advantage of me or abuse me? And that's a legitimate concern because guys have done that in world history, right? What's interesting though is that the bigger fear, I think, uh, is probably not that guys abuse their leadership role, but that they neglect their leadership role. Well, like when they're supposed to be leading, when Adam was supposed to jump in and say, honey, don't eat from that tree. It's not good for you. It's not good for us. He just sits back and he's just he's just on the couch, not doing anything. And the way I see this playing out, even in a, like American Christianity today is I can count on one hand. And in fact, maybe it's one or two or maybe three times in my entire life where I've seen a husband slash father like get up, get engaged in the church and like drag his family to worship, let's say. I don't see that almost ever happening where the wife is just along for the ride. On the other hand, if you say, okay, have you ever seen a woman who has to like, she's a little frazzled on a Sunday morning because she got her kids ready and, and maybe her husband's there, maybe he isn't, or maybe he's there, but he's just like very clearly just along for the ride. Have you seen any women like that? And I think most of us can probably name like dozens of families like that. In other words, it's a neglect of uh, that kind of headship and spiritual leadership. Um, and where do you think, like, it, it's getting more confusing for me and hard for me to even, like, figure out how to talk about this in society today because uh, we really, from early childhood on, we teach uh, boys and girls, and I guess especially girls, you can do anything that a man does any place, and then they get to church, and it's like, well, but it's a little bit different. And so where do you think we're at on that kind of, like, headship concept or authority concept in society? Uh, how do you think we're doing in the church? And what do you think we could do to improve uh, and, and in the ways that we would look different from the world as a church? I think in society, that is um, definitely a trust issue in seeing the way that, you know, some men do take advantage of it, use it and abuse it. Uh, more do than don't. Yeah. And it could be because they just don't know the scriptures or they could be doing it intentionally. I'm not judging that, but it happens. Yeah. And so, you know, that 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 creates trust issues and who they would be leading, you know, mm -hmm. and then when somebody gets hurt and then they find out and it's like, you know, oh, I'm not trusting any man ever again because yeah. that's what all men do. And it could be what the majority do, you yeah. know, so they, they have a valid point and it's like, okay, how many men are you going to, you know, go through before you're just like, you know, forget about it. I give up. That's, yeah, that's helpful. Uh, in talking to women sometimes in counseling, when they tell me a story of their experience, uh, like we've all heard about like trauma um, reactions. So if I have one experience, I kind of project that understandably onto everything moving forward. And um, it's, it's interesting how often I've heard a woman say something like, I'm not going to let a man this or this based on a prior experience, which is a legitimate hurt, but it's, it's like one, this, this incident 
And now it's affecting your relationship with every man moving forward. And you're right, it's a trust issue. Until you have another man that in your, that's in your life who's close, that you see a Christ-like example, you, it's hard to trust a man again. Yeah, and also it's... Um... It's difficult to lead also, you know, because if they see a flaw in you or see you don't know what you're doing, I always think about um, Moses. You know, yeah. he, he led the people around for 40 years. It's yeah. like, okay, some women will follow a man around yeah. <laughs> for 40 years. <laughs> he doesn't know where he's going. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's um, you know, it's it takes a little understanding to, to know, like, okay, as a man, I I might lead you somewhere where I don't know. Yeah, you know, what I mean, it, that might happen, but are you gonna be like, you know, okay, I'm not talking to you anymore, or I'm breaking off with you, or are you gonna be like, okay, well, I'm gonna see how he reacts to it, you know? Yeah. Does he learn from his mistakes, or is he just like, oh well, you know, yeah. whatever? Yeah. You know, but it's uh, yeah. I'm pretty far from marriage, like almost <laughs> as far as you could be. But um, you say that. <laughs> <laughs> you say that. Surprise. <laughs> oh, whoops. we'll see when this um, gets published. Yeah. 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 Well, Sorry, I guys. I think the PR on, uh, you know, women and men and how that looks in a relationship, especially in marriage or in dating, it's been very bad for Christianity, you know, and especially in this day and age where, you know, since the advent of feminism as a movement in the 20th century into now, where it's, you know, the way it looks is it has to be that a woman has equal, if not more rights than a man. And that's, that's how our country perceives um, how a woman should be treated. And yet, you know, exactly what Jesus tells us in the Bible is completely the opposite of that. You know, what, what servant leadership should be like for men in a Christian household, it's, you know, Jesus tells us the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve, you know, and then he washed his disciples feet. This is God. Yeah. And that just shakes me so much because, you know, that is the men. That should be the men in Christian households and yeah. in relationships with women. Um, it's yeah. not anything to do with domineering or being over someone. Um, but I, I often think of, you know, a quote from The Office where Michael and Jim both are co-managers <laughs> and one of the coworkers is like, oh, yeah, you know, why wouldn't this work? You know, who doesn't remember the two popes or, <laughs> yeah. you know, two, two positions equally in power. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, I think God knew someone has to be ultimately the one um, to put their finger on the button. And yeah. that doesn't make you better or worse. Yeah. Um, you know, at, as a manager at FedEx Express, I tell my employees, I'm not better than you. It's just that my job is to set you up for success. And in a way, that's my job with my family. I'm not better than my children or better than my wife. I am there to set them up, up for success, to pass God's word up from one generation to the next. Yeah. So I've had so many failures in the past that for me, if I were in the role of having a spouse or a wife, as soon as that wife would stop being encouraging about my leadership or yeah. role, even if like it's deserving of maybe not being so fully supported at that time. Yeah. Um, as soon as that happens, I'm just going to start building the bad habit of like slowly stepping aside because I, there's all that past failure that I've been through and then I'll start just feeling like that again. And you need the encouragement, you need the support to lead. It's, it's yeah. So that whole I mean, D'Angelo said it's hard to lead. And that's the, like, why don't got more guys, why aren't more guys better at being good leaders? And it's like, well, it's incredibly hard. And who wants that level of responsibility? Like the idea that Adam ducked out pretty early, uh, like when they're in the middle of paradise and he's like, I still don't want that responsibility. And yet the, the kicker is in Genesis 3, when God comes and he graciously hunts them down, because they would have just been content to run away from him. But he searches them down. And who does he confront first? He confronts Adam. And it's like, well, Eve ate from the tree first. Shouldn't he talk to her first? And it's like, nope, because I gave you some kind of weird disproportionate level of responsibility here. And so I'm expecting you to own that. And uh, so it's like, Submitting to like gender design is part sometimes like, okay, it doesn't even matter if I feel like it. And it's it's not about intelligence. I know that. It's not about skills. It's not about 
uh, anything else like measurable dynamic. It just is what it is. And it's interesting because like, I don't feel personally, even in my own marriage and the relationship dynamic, or for that matter, being a pastor in a church, like the idea of, uh, f- feeling like you want to lead doesn't come supernaturally. You know, it does, it just doesn't feel like the way that I'm wired. And yet I know it's God's design. For that matter, uh, my wife, we joke about this often, like we're wired, uh, we're neither of us are overly traditional in our gender wiring kind of thing. Um, and yet I think one of the ways, reasons we've been able to have a healthy and successful marriage is because we thought, nope, but God's word says, here's the way this dynamic is going to look. Let's submit to it and good things will happen, even if it doesn't feel like it's how, what my personality is or, or whatever. And, uh, and he's blessed it. And so I think it's one of those things where kind of the leap of faith is, okay, what does it look like for a man to take responsibility in being a spiritual leader in a household? It might look a little bit different from one family to the next. And it's interesting, in Ephesians 5, Paul doesn't give us a whole lot of details of what it's going to look like, but he nonetheless says it is what it is. And it's like, okay, how do we encourage, as a church, how do we encourage, support men to sort of own that role? Uh, to be spiritual leaders in in their home, in the church, and for that matter, spiritual influences, servant leaders in their community too. Let me ask you guys, uh, what would you like people to know? If there's somebody out there and you said, okay, one takeaway point about like, okay, what is the unique struggles uh, of being a Christian man? And what do I do? What is the mo- most important thing that I do to try to rise to face those struggles? What What might you say? Honestly? Oh, you can go first, Jesse. You started talking. Oh, <laughs> nice. I'll go for it. Um, yeah, so this is going to sound probably completely off the wall based off of everything we said. But honestly, I think the way for a man to almost combat every man's struggle yeah. is just a spirit of gratefulness for all of the things in your life and all the people in your life. Be grateful for the people who you would be in competition with. Yep. Um, be grateful for your enemies. Um, pray for them. Show them love and genuinely, <laughs> genuinely be grateful. And it it changes your life. It changes your perceptions. It really changes everything. Excellent. Demonstrates like conscious gratefulness for everyone in your life that God allows in. And even pray for them, including even your even your enemies. Jesse or D'Angelo, any? Yeah, I uh, I think the one big takeaway I've had in my life just in the last couple of years has been my incredible need for male companionship, for for male friends in my life, people who I can trust, who I can just hang out with, who I can sit down and read a chapter of scripture with, um, who I can pray with. Those are all things that when I was younger, I never would have cared or put much stock in. And now as a husband and a father, um, I think Satan has, he has done a great job. If he can cut you off, you know, mentally or physically from other people, because if it's just you versus him, he's going to win every time. But when we set ourselves up for success, we pair up with other people, you know, have friends that can pray with you, that can go to church with you and hang out with you. Um, Christian people, I think that is such a blessing. And I've been very blessed to have a lot of really strong Christian men in my life. And I know they're there because God knows I need them. And I think going back to pride, you know, if we don't think we need that, then we are dead wrong. And we, we need to get to a place where we are searching for those relationships and parking our pride and doing whatever it takes to, you know, be neck and neck with other Christians. And I know you, you did a sermon a few weeks ago or maybe a month ago about David and Jonathan. Yeah. And I think that sets such a, a perfect example of how Christian friendship should look like. Yeah, that is an ideal. First of all, I love the point about needing uh, Christian men, needing Christian male friends. Uh, and David and Jonathan is like this pinnacle example of what that could and should look like. And yet... I don't remember ever hearing that growing up in my Christian education or Christian study, like the need for, no, you got to have, uh, as an adult male Christian, you got to have friends. Um, in fact, I remember hearing a comedian once, uh, make the joke about one of the, one of the greatest miracles Jesus ever (laughs) 
performed was being a 30 year old man that had 12 friends. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, uh, it just like picking on that thing. Like it's, it's something like 60 or 70% of adult men say they don't have like any close friends. And like, that is like divide and conquer Satan strategy kind of thing. Do you have a guy that you're regularly talking to, regularly praying with, regularly hel helps hold you accountable and encourages you, doesn't judge you, but holds you like you will be so much healthier, you know? So thank you. Um, can you ask the question? I don't want to stray too far from Yeah, that no, that's okay. <laughs> I, I think the idea is the life lesson you've learned in terms of, okay, if anybody at home's thinking, uh, a Christian man, how do you face struggles and temptations? What has been the most important thing that you've learned along the way uh, to help you fight uh, and deal with struggles and temptations? Uh, for me, it's been when you fall into them, uh, it's, it's been squarely on my shoulders, you know? So like this is something that I have to deal with, you know, like um, I suffer the consequences for it personally. You know, sure, it's other people there that'll support me and and encourage me. But a thing for me is, it's like it's always been. It's, it's just on me. Yeah. You know? So if I do something wrong, you know, it's squarely on me. You know, and it's like, you know, that can crush you. So I'm just not gonna do certain stuff. You know. Okay. So there's a level of necessary ownership um, and not making excuses about stuff. And but like, if if stuff comes into my life and there's consequences and like owning some of that along the way, uh, that can be helpful. I also know that, you know, and this is, this is one of those kind of things that I think we all maybe assume as Christians, like we assume things like prayer and stuff like that, but, uh, uh, reading our Bibles regularly, I know as a fact that each of you are in the word on a regular basis and you'll, you know, each touched on that here tonight, but, uh, I can, I've, I've gotten to the point where I can feel when I don't read God's word or I don't pray in the morning. Like, so for me, there's a time in the morning and like by 11 AM and I'm more irritable and I'm more whatever. And I can experience there's like, I figured it out over time. There's like a direct line between not being in God's word, not praying and uh, experiencing the feeling of being overwhelmed by temptation and aggression and anxiety and stuff like that. And I don't know if you, any of you guys have had similar experiences with that. Yes, 100%. Honestly, um, last over the summer, I was not doing a good job reading the Bible. Um, I was spending a lot of my free time watching a TV show. It's amazing, psych. It's a great <laughs> TV show. But uh, towards the end of it, I began kind of noticing something in me. And it was all of a sudden I'd be like quoting these characters all the time and and thinking through the scenes and what would these characters do? And it would just come naturally in their jokes and their laughter. And it got me thinking, man, I miss God so much. And what would happen if I'd be spending all that time <laughs> just reading God's word instead mm -hmm. and growing closer? So I've been doing that for the last month instead. And um, honestly, just taking that hour a day to read the Bible is, it's changing everything. My perception of life is just great. It's I have so much more energy. If things were getting me down, they're not getting me down anymore. Mm. Um, it's incredible. And not to say that there won't be hard times still yeah. if you're reading the Bible every day, but it really does start changing your your perception, your habits, and it, it just brings a lot of fulfillment in yeah. life. Good. Yeah. Perspective inducing. Whatever your influences are in life totally shape your view and perspective. Yeah. I've been a huge... Um, uh, I, I've really struggled with that. And, you know, my alarm goes off at 3.40 every morning. So by the time I leave for work around 4.10, um, you know, I've, I've usually just spent my time, you know, mainlining coffee and kind of just like slapping myself to get myself <laughs> awake so that I can get to work. And, you know, there have been kind of seasons where I've gone out of that habit of, you know, opening my Bible. And even if I can just read it for five or 10 minutes to start the day, I know that that's going to, you know, like you said, by the end of the morning, you know, I'm, I'm way more focused and, you know, kind of what you were touching on Daniel. Um, I'm not sure what, uh, I can't remember where it is, but it's out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, you know, when we are putting God's word into our head, you know, we think about those verses. And even if we just latch onto one one phrase or one bit of scripture each day. That's just, that's going to set our hearts on a, on a better path. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Any final thoughts, guys? 
Then you mind if I close this with a prayer? Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you for these men and thank you for this time here. Uh, some important things for us to keep in mind um, for all of us, that uh, the importance of being in your word regularly, the importance of having Christian male friends, the importance of knowing that our identity is totally in you, uh, the importance of understanding our struggles and just being honest and owning them and uh, being open about it. Lord, uh, we know who we are. We are your redeemed children, your redeemed sons. Uh, who, like our brother Jesus, will reign on high for all eternity because of his grace and his sacrifice. Let us have a tremendous sense of security in who we are so that any power we might have in life will lead us to serve, not to abuse or hurt any others. Help us not to neglect our responsibilities, uh, Lord, but embrace them, understanding that you've only given us what you think is good for us to minister to and that you've given us every resource necessary to lead. Help us uh, to do so wisely. Help our church to be filled with Christian men who want to uh, love the way Christ has loved us and in, are willing to lay down their lives and make sacrifices for that. And ultimately, Lord, may it glorify your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.